Good day and welcome to the Q1 FY24 earnings conference call of HTFC Life Insurance Company Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode. And there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Vibha Padalkar, MD and CEO of HGFC Life. Thank you and over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Michelle. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for participating in this conference call to discuss the financial highlights of the quarter ended June 30th, 2023. Our results, which include the investor presentation, press release, and regulatory disclosures have already been made available on both our website and the stock exchanges. Accompanying me, accompanying me are Suresh Badami, Deputy Managing Director, Neeraj Shah, ED and CFO, Ishwari Murugan, our appointed actuary, and Kunal Jain, representing investor relations. I will provide an overview of our Q1 FY24 results and will be happy to respond to any queries thereafter. We are happy to report that the merger of HJFC Limited with HJFC Bank has been successfully completed and that we are now a subsidiary of HJFC Bank. As you may know, HJFC Limited recently has increased its stake in HJFC Life to more than 50%. And as a result, HDFC Bank now holds 50.4% in HDFC Life. Our focus is on strengthening our partnership with HDFC Bank, enhancing collaboration and maximizing customer engagement within our group. Moving on to our operating performance for the quarter. For ease of comparison, all previous year numbers in our disclosures are on a merged basis, i.e. after including the performance of our then subsidiary Excite Life Insurance. We closed the quarter with a robust growth of 12% in individual WRP, which was 1.5x of private industry, despite coming off a strong march. Our quarter one FY24 market share was 16.4% and 10.6% in the private and overall sector, clocking an expansion of 60 and 90 basis points respectively. Over the last four years, despite facing open architecture and intense competition from unlisted insurers, our market share has steadily increased from 12.5% in FY19 to 16.5% in FY23 in the private sector and 7.2% to 10.8% at an overall industry level. We anticipate that growth will progressively accelerate as the year progresses, with quarter two expected to outpace quarter one and H2 showing stronger growth compared to H1 after adjusting for the one-time excess demand in the month of March. We have also been able to grow the number of individual policies sold by 9% in quarter one FY24 in line with our stated objective of broadening our customer base. We expect our efforts to enhance our distribution capability to reflect in the growth of policy count during the course of the year. We covered more than 2 lakh lives in retail policies and 1.6 crore lives overall in quarter 1 FY24, a growth of 8% and 34% respectively over quarter 1 FY23. Retail <coughs> summer showed recorded an increase of 55% and overall summer showed 73% and our overall market share in quarter 1 FY24 was 16.9%. We feel privileged to have led the way in helping bridge the protection gap in our country by being the market leader in terms of total summer shows. Our overall product mix remains balanced. Amongst the savings products, non par savings stood at 33%, participating products at 26%, ULIP at 25% of individual APE. Other categories which include annuity and protection were 9 and 6% respectively. This quarter witnessed product launches in the pension and ULIP categories, which have been specifically tailored to meet previously unaddressed customer requirements and paving the way for new product subcategories. Overall protection has grown by 35% in quarter one FY24 on a new business premium basis. Retail protection trends remain encouraging with year-on-year -year growth of 45% in quarter one FY24. 
While the growth is accentuated by a favorable base, we do believe that the pickup in protection is sustainable and growth is likely to be healthy for the year. In quarter one FY24, our annuity business contributed to 19% of the new business premium with APE growth of 51%, mainly driven by increased demand for our limited pay annuity product systematic retirement plan. Moving on to key financial and operating metrics. On a like-for-like -like consolidated basis, i.e. including our erstwhile subsidiary, Excite Life, our new business margin for the quarter was 26.2% as against 25.1% in quarter 1 FY23. This has enabled us to deliver value of new business of Rs. 610 crores, which is a growth of 18%. We had achieved margin neutrality in FY23 and would have continued to do so in quarter one FY24 had the demand upfronting in March due to the sunsetting of tax benefits not happened. We are capacitized for higher growth with upfront investments in manpower, distribution, infrastructure and technology. Having said that, with new business APE growth expected to be better in, in H2, we expect our full year FY24 margins to be similar to FY23 NBM by the end of the year. <laughs> As indicated by us earlier, we expect VNB expansion in FY24 to be led by APE growth rather than any significant margin expansion. Our embedded value stood at 41,843 crore as on June 30th, 2023, with an operating return on embedded value of 16% for the quarter. Profit after tax for quarter one FY24 was Rs. 415 crore, representing a year-on-year -year increase of 15%. The profit emergence from our back book continues to show strong growth of 19%. We have included an additional slide in the presentation to provide some perspective on the timing of profit emergence across product categories and correlation to risk or value infos at an overall company level. The board recommended a dividend of Rs 1.90 per share, aggregating to a payout of Rs 408 crores, subject to approval by our shareholders. Our solvency ratio was 200% as on June 30th, 2023. Renewal collection trends continue to be healthy on the back of steady. Our 13th and 61st month persistency was 87% and 53% respectively versus 87% and 52% last year, despite making inroads into tier 2 and 3 towns. Persistency has seen an improvement across product categories, cohorts and geographies over the last few years. Over the last few years, our persistency has improved from 89% to 92% in tier 1 markets from 84% to 87% in Tier 2 markets, and from 80% to 84% in Tier 3 markets. This performance gives us the confidence to continue our journey of deepening our customer engagement beyond metro cities. Next on channel performance. Our bank assurance channel has grown by over 25% in quarter one FY24 based on individual APE. We are witnessing robust growth across all our large partnerships. With HDFC Bank as our promoter, we will work towards enhancing the availability and accessibility of insurance across the bank's customer base and increasing our market presence within the bank's operations. Our agency channel grew by more than 1.5x company growth in terms of individual APE. We continue to increase our agent network by adding over 15,000 agents in quarter one FY24. With respect to our acquisition, we are effectively realizing synergies both in terms of revenue generation and expense management and our efforts are on track. We are proud to be recognized as one of India's top 10 best companies to work for by great places to work. We are the only insurance company to receive this recognition, which is a testament to our unwavering commitment to creating a people-centric workplace. While we remain optimistic about growth opportunities in, in the life insurance sector, our vision extends beyond just business growth. Following a customer-centric approach, we remain steadfast in our mission to insure India and ensure financial security for families and individuals across the nation. We believe that widespread financial protection is a crucial aspect of economic growth, and we are enthusiastic about collaborating with our regulator to contribute meaningfully to this collective effort. The detailed disclosure on our results is available in our investor presentation. We are happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, ma'am. We will now begin the question and answer session. 
anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Suresh Ganapati from Macquarie Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, we have two questions. One is on the HDFC Bank uh, channel. So the counter share was 55%. Has it uh, changed this quarter? Have you seen better traction? Anything on that? Um, yes, uh, Suresh. Uh, this has been targeted in the sense that uh, some of the branches that have been uh, somewhat of laggards, uh, there has been a, a fairly deep and um, joint focus on those and that has seen traction and hence overall close to about uh, uh, just shy of 100 basis points has been the traction that we have seen between 50 to 100 basis points depending on which zone you see in terms of overall market share. So early days uh, but in the positive direction. Another interesting uh, point, while that was not your question, is that uh, our uptick in protection uh, that we are able to sell at HDFC Bank and hence uh, just collaborating in terms of what are the right products to sell and so on. So there also we have managed to make a fair bit of inroad in, uh, and this is something we've always been mentioning, that protection levels at HDFC Bank can uh, be higher and uh, that is something that we have uh, Manage to do and will continue to do. Mr. Kantati, do you have yeah. any other questions? Yeah, yeah, one more question. Uh, Viva, just on the BNB margins and growth, I had. I mean, um, I mean, uh, your original guidance was 15% AP growth, excluding the um, thousand crores one off of last year, right? So that translates into a 7% reported AP growth. Now, if I were to ex extrapolate saying that the margins are flat, you're looking at, say, 7% VNB growth. So my point here is, I mean, your margins are lower than what your uh, competitors are, closer to 30%. What explains this difference? And, uh, and also the fact that you would expect better synergies coming from Excite Life then why is the margin projection a bit more conservative despite protection actually uh, uh, growing pretty fast? Thanks. Yeah, a few points here. Um, one of the largest, I'll come to the versus peers uh, comparison, um, but on a standalone basis, uh, first is that uh, we first quarter of last year, we did not have Excite Life, and we did mention at that point in time that uh, Excite Life had low single-digit margins. From H1 onwards, we uh, started showing consolidated margins. So if you were to look at slide 24 of our investor presentation, we have given the walk for both, uh, both with Excite Life and without uh, Excite Life. Second point is we have said that uh, margin neutrality, so we feel reasonably confident that by the end of the year there will be margin neutrality. Uh, there, uh, one of the, or perhaps the uh, only reason in terms of uh, not having, uh, uh, falling slightly short of margin neutrality, which means standalone HTFC life margins in quarter one is purely because of the tax reason. Um, and typically our growth rate has been in the range of 17-18% versus an AP growth that we've seen of 13%, total AP growth of 13%. So that shortfall, and we're capacitized for 17-18%. Once we start making up for that shortfall, margins will uh, rise, and, and month on month we have continued to trend upwards. So it's more in terms of fixed cost leverage because of the capacitization. Uh, so that but is the as far as protection. Growth. Protection will not help you. Yeah. I mean, the fact that it's yeah. going faster. Yeah. So it is. So so it, it is. But in terms of VNB and the volume, I have to sell maybe three protection policies or one saving. Uh, you know, in terms of the volume of it. So that is one. Second is why protection has gone up, but non-par savings has gone down. So to some extent, there has been a trade-off. And second is, you will also see uh, in our uh, investor presentation on product mix, 
uh, for the quarter, uh, uh, unit link has gone up slightly because of the market. Uh, it's it's mm -hmm. very very small numbers. So if you were to look at uh, this is uh, slide 16, you see quarter one FY 23 unit link was 23 percent versus uh, this quarter is 25 percent. So 200 basis points, which will correct. We are very sure that it will correct over a period of time. But uh, in customer interest, if you know, typically when ma when markets do well. There is a bit of uptick in unit link, and PAR has gone down a little, little bit. So there have been trade-offs between uh, protection versus others. So if this scenario had panned out wherein protection uptick had happened uh, and tax changes had not happened, then clearly no question about it, margin uplift would have happened very significantly. But uh, in the whole scheme of things, given that, if you recall, just two or three months ago, uh, post the tax changes, uh, the industry was expected, best case scenario, to be flat. So against that, I think the 13% uh, just goes to show that the correlation between tax, uh, that being the only play, that is is clearly has been refuted. Uh, and every month we have grown very well. Uh, and each month has successively been better than the earlier month. And that's why that gives us the confidence about uh, quarter two being better than quarter one and um, uh, you know, overall H2 being better than H1. And overall we have grown 1.5x the industry. Now coming to your question on industry, um, Suresh, we can get to 30% if we were to lose market share. But our market share, as you see, has actually expanded by 90 bits. Right, so um, there will always be a trade-off in terms of uh, we want to stay relevant. We don't want to lose our ranking uh, as among the top three in the, including LIC in the in the life insurance space. And actually, if you look at slide six, you'll see that every year from FY19 to FY23, a we have grown faster than the uh, overall private sector and overall sector, and our market share expansion. So we were 12.5% in FY19, and we reached 16.5% in FY23. So that is the philosophy of triangulating and not wanting to lose our position in terms of ranking. Uh, and, and then that hopefully answers the, why can't I be 30%? I can easily be 30%. Right? So it's this triangulation wherein we will grow uh, brick by brick. Uh, the pause was only because of the tax. But uh, uh, this year we will come out uh, similar margin neutral to last year, and next year we will continue to move up. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is from the line of Adarsh from CLSE. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Vipa. Uh, congrats. Um, the question on protection, um, obviously protection is now growing from a low base. Just want to understand... Uh, Sorry, Adarsh, can you uh, come closer to the mic, please? Sir, your okay, voice yeah. is muffled, actually. We are not sure. able to hear you clearly. Sure, I think hopefully this should be better. Uh, Sir, this can you use your uh, handset, please? Uh, using my uh, phone, so it should be okay now. Could you uh, please keep it a little bit far from your mouth and speak? Is this better or I'll come back later? Yes, sir. Please continue. Okay. I'm sorry about this. Um, protection, just wanted to understand how, uh, you know, uh, even you and I threw seen a good pickup. So just wanted to ask how sustainable this uh, pickup looks. Uh, what are the factors driving this now? Yeah, I'll hand this over to Suresh. Okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, so, you, you know, um, of course, there are multiple elements in terms of why we are seeing a protection uptake. Uh, first, of course, yes, we see a customer demand and we believe that will be sustainable uh, in terms of, you know, whether we see the kind of web searches which are happening, uh, HDFC life name search in terms of term and protection which is happening. Clearly, we are seeing a customer level demand. The second piece also is that we are now looking at uh, moving higher activation on our frontline sales across all uh, geographies uh, in a very calibrated and you know uh, product centric approach. So what we are trying to do is trying to see whether we can have return of premium products in the tier two and tier three, whether we can have a uh, you know better uh, mix of. Uh, term products in the uh, larger markets and based on which what has happened is we have been trying to grow uh, the overall uh, retail protection. Uh, of course on the credit life side, you know, 
given that we are a little agnostic in terms of how our protection is growing between retail and credit life, uh, we have managed to maintain our market share across most of our credit life partners. Their disbursements have grown. On top of that, our penetration and value penetration have grown across multiple, multiple verticals, which is there. We are also using a lot of uh, you know, brand awareness in terms of protection. You must have recently seen the uh, Rishabh Pant uh, you know, campaign that we have done. We do believe that with a combination of visibility, data analytics, a lot of those efforts at a specific customer level, we are able to push protection. And this focused effort will probably remain right through the year. And last point I want to uh, mention here, Adarsh, is that if you just look at uh, uh, slide 16 in our product mix, even if you look at the bank assurance, you will see that a term has gone up from 4% to 5%. So on 50% of our business, you're looking at uh, you know uh, an uptick. So it was 3%. Um, and then it went to 4%, well, 4% was uh, quarter one of last year, and then 5%. So that kind of a meaningful growth that you're beginning to see, which is what I alluded to in the earlier question, um, across our channels is, uh, and this is without, and I want to stress, this is without doing anything uh, um, adventurous on the underwriting guidelines or even on pricing. Uh, so in a calibrated but focused basis, uh, of course, some of this... Uh, uh, is also uh, whatever we went through uh, during COVID and then repricing and then price increases. So there was a little bit of um, uh, one had to socialize that all of these changes had happened uh, and people deferring decisions to buy protection. So the combination of all of that uh, coming through and also I'll be honest because this on savings, uh, what we did uh, go through as a sector uh, forced us to also focus on protection, which also we alluded to in April. Let, let me also add, I think, you know, it's not just in terms of the product uh, features as such as well as the activation. I think there's a lot of effort in terms of our conversion efficiencies. There is spent effort in terms of, you know, how do we look at uh, the overall end-to-end -end throughput, the speed of being able to uh, convert the policies which have got logged in, and we are seeing significant upward movement on that front also. Got it. Thank you. Uh, the broker channel, right, which is seen a doubling of the share of term, uh, does that include online players? Or I just wanted to check that. That is right. Uh, you know, some of the players like Policy Bazaar and all are now moved from a web aggregator to a broking uh, code. So they reflect under the broker code. Got it. And uh, the second question is now, if you go back um, to the last call or what you've been saying with the merger of the group, um, the share you'll end the year or you aspire to end the year with a 70% wallet share, which is a very big move from where we were last year. So, um, you know, obviously you started moving in this quarter, uh, small changes and branches you mentioned. Uh, what's the big change that will happen on ground for you? To, and then do you see that uh, playing out to up to 70% or it will be a little more gradual? So I'll, I'll add on to what Viva mentioned in the first answer to Suresh. Uh, so, you know, we have seen a slight increase uh, on 0.5 uh, to 1% increase overall in terms of a market share across GFC Bank. Uh, but uh, to your point to say, will it be gradual or will it be uh, overnight? I think it will be gradual and it is because it is going to be calibrated both at the bank level as well as at our level. Uh, we have multiple levers that we have, uh, you know, identified in terms of how do we increase our market share, uh, whether it's in terms of certain branches in certain geographies where we believe we need to put in more effort, whether it's in terms of certain products that we need to focus on jointly, whether it's in terms of manpower that we need to deploy at a certain number of branches. And there are these six, seven levers where there is a high level of engagement between the bank part and third party team as well as our team in terms of what are, what is it that we want to do. Clearly, we don't want to dilute any of the underwriting standards or we want to change too much in terms of pricing. So it will be, you know, moving up on a calibrated manner. But given the messaging which has come from the senior management of the bank and the ground level effort that our team has been putting in, we can see the traction has started to show across multiple geographies. Got it. No, I will just, uh, thanks for this clarification. So just wanted to check, is, is uh, whether that, that 70% still remains an aspiration by the year end or on-ground implementation can be a little more spaced out? 
Yes, see, the 70% is not a number that we are articulating. Uh, and uh, it's up to the bank how they see it. But um, see, it's not, be, not even been a month uh, since uh, the final consummation of the merger. So uh, the bank will be in a new avatar of a conglomerate as against a bank. Uh, and as that organically starts seeping in and how uh, leadership at the bank have said how we can upsell many things to the customer. So it's a, uh, it's a strategy that will be led by the bank as the parent. What Suresh alluded to are all the things that we are doing so that no stone is left unturned. Um, to meet them halfway to say that, okay, uh, you know, we burned our spurs, we have done XYZ things and we have really been really efficient on conversion, on um, on how uh, we're handling complaints and so on. And then it's up to the bank to, uh, to see as to um, how they uh, execute what they have already started articulating in terms of uh, various bouquet of products uh, that they can upsell to the customer. But yeah, it will it will be brick by brick, Adish, uh, in terms of uh, um, you know how we collaborate. But it is being done uh, every day uh, on a daily basis. These conversations uh, are happening at various levels. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Vivek. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management will be able to address questions from all participants in the conference, please limit your questions to two per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, please see join the queue. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Anuj Singla from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good evening, Viva. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so, Viva, uh, following up on the protection side only, uh, can you give some color on how the strategy of growth in tier two and three cities has progressed on uh, on the policy split side, first of all? Uh, if we can give some color how the policy uh, split has been shaping up uh, since uh, we started this uh, focus. And secondly, uh, can you also uh, talk about how the mix of protection is changing in tier two, three, like you mentioned in your remarks, uh, more ROP probably, and maybe lower ticket size. So should we expect the VNB margins of protection growth in these cities being lower versus the back book? Yeah, sure. So uh, what we are uh, looking at is, uh, I'll, I'll just give you a step back in terms of why we were hesitant. Earlier we were a little bit hesitant because of a couple of things. Um, lesser of salaried, um, uh, and so non-standard in income proofs and how we uh, process that from an underwriting perspective. Also, reinsurers uh, were hesitant also against the COVID backstop. Now, some of those things we have managed to uh, continue to iron out with reinsurers wherein we've gone very, very in a detailed manner to say um, from a strat strategy perspective or an objective perspective, we want to get into tier two and three. Now, uh, how do we make ourselves comfortable with non-standard in income proof? So we started off by also piggybacking and learning from a lot of NBFCs that do this. Yes, they don't do medical underwriting, but at least financial underwriting. Uh, so doing that, starting to take less than maybe 50 lakh cover on our book, and then uh, having conversations with reinsurers to say this book is something that they can look at, um, and whether they want to do a quota share on that book, because we had already started writing that business and, and showing skin in the game rather than just being a pass-through. Um, then we looked at uh, the return of premium because uh, just in terms of pitch for that segment, we realized that it's probably being seen even more so as an expense than, okay, I get protection, but I'll get my money back. Uh, and like we've always said, we don't want to sit in judgment in terms of uh, what should the customer be doing and uh, thinking for the customer just the way all of us on this call are able to think or, or our priorities are different. So we said, fine, uh, we'll do that as long as we are able to explain that these are all the different protection products that they have as a choice as against only return of uh, premium. Uh, so looking at that aspect, also looking at uh, what we realized, and also we had some preconceptions that the ticket sizes will be quite small. We were actually surprised that the ticket sizes of um, you know, tier uh, one versus tier two, if, if tier one is a little bit over uh, a lakh, say, uh, you know, about 1.3 lakh, tier two was about 85 or 1,000. 
and not 50,000 or 40,000, right? And also we were ourselves surprised when we started going deeper that tier 3 uh, ticket sizes would be in the range of about 70 or 1,000, 70 to 75,000. So we were able to um, get more and more comfortable with that. Now, uh, the only thing is, and that's why in my opening remarks I talked about persistency. In different cohorts, whether it is protection or whether it is in savings, persistency is going to be different. And we are no longer afraid of it because we have to, you know, demand is away from the top 10 cities. And uh, over a period of time, uh, we, we will disclose, we certainly track internally as to different cohorts. Tier 1, what is the persistency, like I shared just now. As long as within that cohort, the persistency is the same or slightly better, then the mixed impact is something we should not be afraid of. And uh, it was a bit of a... Uh, um, revelation moment for us after Excite Life because what happened with Excite Life and we've told you this that the persistency of Excite Life business was inferior to HDFC Life business. However, the persistency of Excite Life business standalone has started improving by about 400 basis points on almost every cohort just because of some simple things of getting standing instructions, making callings and you know that, calling well in advance and uh, you know that sort of thing. So. So we realize that we are okay with that as long as uh, you know those cohorts, uh, the persistency is uh, what it is. And this improvement is something that we will continue to see. And over the last three years, like I've mentioned in my opening remarks also, that the improvement uh, is something we have seen across this cohort. So it's a combination of underwriting risks that we see um, as well as uh, the, the the product pitch to the customer, the distributors also, thanks to EOM guidelines and many other things, distributors are also aligned um, to it. Um, and uh, us getting over what will persistency be, what will mortality exp experience be, and so on. As long as we're pricing it right, even the mortality experience, while it is likely to be inferior to, uh, uh, to perhaps a salaried metro kind of a profile, um, it's something that, you know, we are, uh, we think that there's an opportunity and it can be, that opportunity can be mined in a sensible manner. Got it. Got it, Viva. Thank you. And the second question is on EOM regulations. Um, how do you see the commission levels? Is there some commission pressure and how is the competitive landscape on the distribution side changing uh, because of this? See, um, uh, you know, the regulator, uh, the reason we ha they've given us this flexibility is to say that you know you guys are now you've been around for a while and please behave responsibly uh, and uh, we would want to respect uh, that ethos uh, to be able to say that uh, it's not completely uh, you know just because you can do uh, much higher levels um, uh, it, it will be done irresponsibly what we might do is that uh, it could be that some activities were uh, paid for separately to the distributor. Now you pay it uh, as a fully loaded commission and say tell the distributor or the partner that you guys can run those uh, activities for us that uh, as customer outreach and so on. So that's what you will be. So I don't see any difference, any impact on the customer or any impact on the organization. Got it. Got it, Vima. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nishchan Savati from Kotak Institutional Equities. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, you know, two questions from my side actually. Uh, you know, we can see that the uh, you know in the individual AP, the the share of bank assurance has gone up uh, significantly. In fact, the overall growth in bank assurance is uh, is very high. So, you know, how should we read this? Is it, is it, is it that, uh, and, and, and you kind of mentioned that your counter share in HDFC Bank has sort of just about inched up. So is it, is it something that HDFC Bank has kind of grown at a very strong, uh, you know, rate this quarter, or is it the, is it uh, the contribution of other banks? Uh, um, three, four points on this. One, of course, HGFC Bank has seen a fairly good growth in quarter one as compared to last year. Uh, and, you know, at an overall level, while our market share has inched up, they have shown fairly good growth. Uh, second, we have obviously been supported by a lot of other large partners, whether it's Yes Bank, IDFC Bank, Bandhan, multiple such large partners, including many of the SOBs where we have very strong presence, who have also helped us grow. It's not that our proprietary has not grown. I, 
our agency business continues to do well and also has also gone gone fairly well there has been a little bit of a dip in the broker segment which has led to an increased contribution because broker has had a little bit higher share of the higher ticket size uh, you know par and non par and that has slowed down so both our agency as well as our overall bank are have shown significant growth and once broker comes back uh, over this year we will find all channels uh, firing again thanks uh, the second question is really on uh, you know group savings and annuity and uh, you know that's the Uh, it is not usually margin margin accretive so uh, it is more it, it's more you know the, the reason we are in this business is more in terms of relationships and uh, being in the market um, by group savings presumably you mean all the funds that we manage right group funds that's right that's right yeah and so not not very it's accretive but not usually accretive so gives i would say that it gives more of, as a Well, anything else? You know, and and it tends to be lumpy. Uh, you are in discussions for a long time with a particular corporate or PSU and so on, and then it comes through, or they have shifted from one insurer to the other, or you know. So it tends to be seasonal also. So I would not. Uh, it's good, but I would not read too much from a margin perspective. And and if I can add, you know, I mean, similar to way the way we have been managing a balanced product mix on the retail side, I think we, even last year, if you had seen, we had calibrated our approach on the group savings and group credit life as such had grown significantly for us, which continues to grow. So we have been shifting within group savings to the unit link kind of product, which are better in terms of profitability. So you may find that a little moderated, but will be much more profitable than the regular traditional group savings products. Got it. And on the seg the segmental mar seg segmental margins in the in the non par. Um, yeah, you want to take? Yeah, so margins are fairly similar uh, compared to uh, what we've had in the past. Just adjusting for this uh, gap in the growth that we spoke about earlier on the call. Uh, basically, our two-year aspiration is to go higher than what we have in quarter one. So uh, adjusted for that, margins have been fairly similar, given that uh, as such, nothing much has changed in terms of average ticket size. At very high ticket size, of course, uh, volume has uh, uh, in fact got impacted uh, to some extent as expected. But it's been more than made up by the growth in the other ticket sizes, where uh, at an overall level, the average ticket size has been maintained for the segment. And as a consequence of that, uh, margins are more or less where uh, they were uh, earlier as well. There are uh, competitive pressures, uh, as you can expect in all categories, including this one. But uh, we've been maintaining our pricing discipline by and large over the period since we launched this product category. And uh, there could be a, maybe a lag of uh, a month or so here and there in terms of uh, getting back to the pricing levels that you would like. But uh, we've been fairly disciplined about that. to be able to achieve this perfect thank you thank you very much uh, that answers my question uh, all the best thank you thank you the next question is from the line of rishi junjunwala from iifl institutional equities please go ahead yeah thanks for the opportunity can you hear me uh, clearly yes sir please proceed okay great um um so just wanted to you know understand you put in the slide this time slide 12 which talks about emergence of existing business surplus um so how do we read that and you know if on that we're talking about shift in cost to find for longer term saving um but if we look at ev surplus uh, as a percentage of vif that is inching down so what would be the reason for that <laughs> See, the reason really is in terms of uh, longer term products release uh, indian gap profits over a longer period of time that's that's all there is to it so if you see that slide that you referring to on the left hand side uh, by category of products you will see the emergence is happening over a different uh, period so if you take unit link for example a large part of the surplus is getting generated in the first uh, uh, you know five years of the product uh, being uh, sold 
And if you look at uh, traditional products, you find that just about uh, 20 to 25 percent is happening in the first five years, and a lot of it is back-ended. So that's just the nature of the uh, product and the, the situation that arises because of the accounting treatment that we have at this point in time. From an economic perspective, it's uh, clearly more uh, value accretive. It's just that the uh, cash generation or ca release to uh, the Indian gap profits happens over different uh, points in time. That's the reason why we've uh, you know, highlighted this across the three main product categories, the traditional savings, protection, which includes both individual and group, which lies somewhere in the middle, and then you have uh, unit link products. And uh, on the right-hand side, what you basically have is that uh, at, at, what, at uh, what percentage of the WIF can you actually give or take, uh, think of uh, the emerging sub, uh, the business surplus that can emerge over a period of time. So that is in the 19-20% zone as, uh, you know, the product profile has been changing over the last uh, three to four years. What used to emerge earlier because of, let's say, in FI18 and uh, prior to that, unit link used to be about... Uh, 45-50% uh, of the mix, that has now become 25% of the mix. So while the margin expansion has happened over the same period, the generation of surplus is happening over a longer period of time. And to basically give comfort in terms of delivery of this is basically operating variances which have been positive right through this period. So that does give us that uh, comfort that while the surplus is emerging over a longer period of time, it is more value adding in terms of economic terms and uh, operating variances being positive tells us that this is definitely coming. Understood. And and just secondly, on the uh, you know last time you had called out uh, you know spends that you are doing on your new technology initiative. Uh, just so just wanted to understand uh, you know where are we on that uh, for this year and uh, you know how much it could be next year and uh, what is the impact of that on margins at all material. Yeah, so we are uh, continuing uh, on track with uh, uh, with our tech transformation, which is uh, uh, project inspired, um, and uh, we have completed our diagnos diagnostics in terms of uh, our as is, uh, as well as where do we want to um, be towards, which are the um, uh, projects that we want to focus on and change immediately. Uh, and now we are in the process of identifying some of the specialist partners who can uh, start work on uh, changing some of those. It could be uh, without giving away too much in terms of um, um, uh, our CRM or it could be in terms of uh, how we integrate, uh, how we have um, seamless onboarding and, and so on. Um, so we are in that phase right now. Uh, we did say that uh, it is a 250 crore outlay in total, of which 50 crores was expended last year. This year we are on track to spend 100 crores and next year 100. Now this could be a little bit off here or there depending on, um, what, you know, uh, do we include more upfront, do we uh, phase it out a little bit more to next year, but largely it's on track. Got it. Thank you so much, all of us. Yeah, I, I'm not sure whether you want to me to repeat in terms of what are the benefits, uh, or that is reasonably clear. No, that's that's clear. Thank you, Vibha. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sanket Godha from Evander Spark. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the first first question is on some data keeping. The unwind rate seems to be an eight percentage. Uh, which is very similar to last year. Uh, just wanted to understand. Uh, uh, it seems to be conservative. You want to maintain it at that level, or or how should we read this number? Uh, given given the equity markets are doing well. And second, uh, on the data keeping is is, is uh, uh, eight ten crores. Uh, can you split uh, the uh, number into equity and debt uh, on on how how it, uh, uh, where it where it has come from basically? That's what my first question. Then second, I have more on bank, which which my ask after you answer this. Yeah, I'll pass it on to Ishwari. Go ahead, Ishwari. Yeah, on, the, on the unwind rate, we look at the assets that we are holding, and based on the expected return, uh, the unwind rate is, rate is computed. So if you look at the unwind rate of last year, it was based on the uh, expected yield on the debt assets, which 
were again split into short term and longer term and short term yields were lower whereas the long term returns were very high as against that this year the yield curve was flattened so the yields have changed across the tenure but the increase is not similar across the different tenures so the weighted average increase is quite small if you look at all the tenures of the bonds that we are holding we hold a lot of bonds in the longer end so while the shorter end has increased a lot on a weighted average basis it's very small number that's why you you see that there's a small increase and maybe the perception that it is conservative is not so it's a very mathematical calculation based on the assets and the expected returns and on the equity yes last year we were expecting a flattish Uh, investment return and the upside that we expect this year has been incorporated, but that's getting offset to some extent from the excited bank book. Well, the excited bank book doesn't have a lot of equity given that they are mostly par business with a low equity exposure. That's why that offsetting impact is uh, reflected in the unwind rate of 8.2 percent. On the uh, investment variance of 8 and 10 crores, that is broadly spread between the impact of equity and impact of debt. In both, we have positive uh, impact. In equity, the uh, the markets have rallied and it's around 10 percent return in this quarter compared to our expectation of 2 to 1.5 percent. That's where a positive upside of around 500 crores. On the debt, the short end has flattened and that in, uh, that has uh, for the short end has. Um, Flatten, but uh, sorry, I mean steepened a little compared to March 23, and that has resulted in a increase in the value of the debt for the shareholder funds of the risk asset. That impacts around 260 to 270 crores, and the balance is uh, some impact because of the period spread narrowing. Okay, uh, thank you, ma'am, for that. A uh, 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 second question, uh, Viva, for you is basically uh, 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 we understand that HDFC Bank will 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 uh, probably will uh, market share will increase as as the time will progress. But but if you can give a little clear thought process, how it will happen? Whether whether uh, you will uh, uh, penetrate more into the customers? Uh, what is our current penetration ratio? Whether it is an NOP strategy or a ticket side strategy? Whether you will add more more people? Which products you are targeting? So, so maybe maybe you have touched upon some points here, but but if you if you can little explain in more more clarity, uh, how exactly this 55 to 70 journey or or closer to that number will be evolved in, in say next two or three years? What will the target might be? See, um, even in other relationships wherein there is no uh, parent-child, parent-subsidiary uh, kind of connection, um, there are shares. a uh, counter shares that go up and down and it's not just that uh, it is driven uh, because of the customer but it's often driven within the bank uh, that strategically uh, uh, x insurer versus y insurer so the way to do it it there isn't one way there are uh, many ways for example uh, there could be um, right you know maybe lesser people at the branch because uh, i am of the school of thought that um learning from some of the other geographies perhaps at bank assurance uh, unbridled kind of um number of insurance people um being deployed at branches is not optimal from the bank any bank's point of view so one way is to curtail is today it is not curtailed one way is to curtail and for the bank to curtail uh and then to uh, maybe like in home loans for example uh, and that's how hcfc has been doing that if there are leads then you don't really need three people descending on a customer at a branch it could be that the lead is passed on to the customer um or there is a virtual fulfillment uh, with the aid of the rm uh, you know and so on so that that is one way of doing things uh, which uh, in a against what it is today say at hcfc bank wherein they aren't really focused on how many people do they want at each of the branches so that is one and that itself today my market share my people market share uh, people uh, uh, share fit on street at hcfc bank is 40% but my market share is in the is in the mid 50s so um, so that itself it does a curtailment uh, could give an uplift another way to do this is uh, if you recall really at hcfc bank uh, even before multi tie it was hcfc life that had trained all of hcfc bank people into becoming yeah. specified personnel and then it was added over Uh, uh under the construct of open architecture so um insurers that came in under open architecture benefited from um from the investment in terms of training and collaboration and getting them licensed and training on insurance that hcfc life had done the heavy lifting 
so it could be that for some time a new branch does not um, have all companies at that branch so there are various such ways uh, but obviously uh, it's these are interse discussions between parent and subsidiary and not really something that i want to go go into for reasons i'm sure you'll understand yes uh, suresh you want to add anything to this yeah so i you, you know i think uh, fee revenue for the bank is also important and i think the branch team understands at fair depth in terms of the branch level penetration the customer penetration i think they are actively looking at how like viva mentioned how do they increase the number of branches which are activated there is a huge amount of focus which is coming in from the bank who have specified persons who are uh, you know present at each of these branches uh, we can obviously support in terms of training in terms of certification we can look at how do we ensure that they are trained and then then they are activated so <laughs> yeah, at a unit level there is a fair amount of uh, you know focus in terms of how do we get more and more participation clearly the bank has a huge focus on deposits is a huge focus on many of the other bank products but the ability for our team as well as some of the other insurers to ensure that insurance as a product penetrates deeper i think that is fairly well settled and hdfc bank has been delivering year on year there has been no doubt if you look at the kind of growth that the bank has been able to perform at our end clearly you know what can we do to improve our product proposition how do we improve our operational efficiencies how do we come out with products which are better than competition how do we get people uh, to get better lead conversion ratios on the lead that are passed on to us i think there is a fair amount of focus and that will automatically come in got it got it and and, and last one from my side probably uh, he, uh, 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 it's, it's a known fact now that that, that our cost uh, uh, associated with hdfc bank is relatively on the higher side now given the relationship changes um, between parent and child uh and uh, then then uh, do we expect that that the uh, the cost what we pay to hdfc bank will still remain at those levels or or it will broadly grow in line with the ap growth what channel will give us see uh, we look at this as fully loaded cost uh, and um, um what the bank has been able to to give us uh, is that uh, Uh, you know a, a very different category of customer uh, so ability for us to mine that customer so i think it is not quite right to say uh, one particular distributor's cost some more or it's a, it's a, uh, what margin does one make out of it uh, what is the persistency uh, so expense is one aspect but mortality expense uh, experience mm-hmm. uh, for, at the same expense is a different so all of those um, assumptions will impact uh, what the uh, you know the margin is Uh, so whether the bank if i understand your question right whether the bank will uh, take into consideration that we are now a subsidiary and leave something on the table i think these kind of conversations are more for the bank um, but when the bank says parent child i think it subsumes many such big and small things which uh, will come out of these discussions uh, which i assure are happening at a, a very very regular basis but i think it will happen because for them also to switch a hat from being a bank to a conglomerate uh, is not even a month old got it got it uh, final one at the, at the board uh, the bank bank people have started sitting i mean just just wanted to understand uh, when when the board constitution will change so that uh, um we have uh, people from bank sitting in the board so um uh, relu karna uh, who has been the hdfc limited nominee uh, has uh, today was her last day at, a, at this agm so she is not her mm-hmm. tenure is not getting uh, renewed for now um and so on so some of these changes uh, are uh, are not very far off in terms of uh, somebody from from the bank said coming on to our board got it uh, thanks thank you brother so much yeah. sure thank you the next question is from the line of supratin datta from ambed capital please go ahead hi thanks for the opportunity so starting off with uh, uh, the first question could you give me the proportion of policies in quarter 1 that was about 5 lakhs and how has that changed compared to last year then the second question that i had was it seems like you have in this quarter been able to get about 100 million in synergies from the exide acquisition uh, could you talk about what more synergies could you extract from that business and what you know how much more synergies is left to 
uh, to be gotten from that business. And lastly, the third question that I had was, uh, could you talk about the strategy of you know separating the growth and focus markets in the agency channel and what kind of productivity improvement and AP growth could these deliver? So, yeah, so Suprasim, I'll start off with the first one. The first one is uh, about 5 lakhs is about high single digits. Uh, I'll pass on to uh, Neeraj for the um, Excite Life and then maybe Suresh can uh, take the growth in the, uh, in the, you know, the agency split. Right, on the Excite Life uh, synergy, is we basically started off with uh, very simply in terms of uh, what is it that we can do to protect the revenues and uh, what is it that we can do in terms of rationalizing uh, costs. So from a cost perspective, uh, any infrastructure which was, uh, you know, uh, something which was uh, in, let's say, uh, duplication was something that was addressed first up in terms of branch infrastructure and uh, also in terms of all uh, corporate expenses, obviously all of them are something which gets done as one unit now. So these are some of the things that kind of came in which helped us get to margin neutrality ahead of plan, if you recollect. When we were talking about the transaction in the early days, we had basically said that we want to get to first is to get to margin neutrality on pre-merger basis, which we did. And uh, since then, the focus, uh, as the integration completely has uh, got uh, done now, in terms of using technology to get the Excite Life distribution, to be able to use SDFC Life digital assets, as well as in terms of access to products, which has something that has uh, already started showing up in terms of uh, the channel growth, as well as in terms of the changing ticket sizes. So a lot of these things have started to happen, and now uh, obviously the entire business uh, is completely aligned into our overall agency business. And uh, the tier two, tier three story that we are talking about is something that is only getting enhanced by this uh, entire uh, combination. So we did speak about uh, the tier one, tier two, tier three distribution and uh, how things have progressed uh, in the past uh, uh, few months. Uh, this is something that is uh, definitely adding to that. Uh, persistency is improving. Ticket sizes are uh, are uh, getting bigger. So the quality of business that is coming through from these markets is definitely better than what it used to be three years and five years back. So that gives us more confidence to actually uh, get this model into other geographies uh, compared to where it was when it started off. So that's that's you know uh, how things are progressing on the uh, the merger front.